talk about prayer then because the whole reason for prayer, the concept that we've had, has always been to make the out here be what we think it should be. Or better. Better. So if I'm going to pray, prayer won't work like that. No, so prayer doesn't do that. But this is saying Holy Spirit answers prayer or God answers yeah. prayer. Yeah. Let's go back. Well, I thought, I thought prayer was prayer. Prayer. make you perceive things differently. But then, then you get into this will of God and what is the will of God and then there's things, the will of God is my will. It's all stirred up to me. It doesn't fit together. So, yeah, you raised two or three good yeah. questions yeah. there. Got a lot. Whole thing. I'm uh, good material here. <laughs> yeah, like, prayer, prayer is a good one because, you know, the, even from the Bible, seeking you shall find, knocking the door shall be open. If you come through Eastern routes, the law of karma, you know, as you sow, you sow, show, you reap, and everything. However you want to take it, it's all this fundamental thing that giving and receiving are the same. Now, there's a part in the Song of Prayer, which is prayer, forgiveness, and healing, where Jesus describes prayer as like a ladder, that when you're really bound into the world of form, you can't help but pray for form, you know? Help heal my child. Help protect Aunt Martha on her trip to India. Um, help um, end world hunger and poverty. You know, you can't help but when you, if you believe in the reality of the things around you, how can you help but pray like that? And Jesus is saying, as he told Helen, you know, it's not wrong to pray in that way, but, but there are higher realms of prayer. And it gets back to what George was talking about when you start getting back to perceptual. You know, help me see this differently is a, is a prayer that the Course makes and says in many, many different ways. Because that's really bringing it back to it's, it's a perceptual problem. And I've got distorted perception and I need another way to look at this. I need to see peace instead of this. And really it comes the deepest level as you go to the higher rungs of the ladder is described at one point Jesus says your prayer is your desire. So if your desire is single and whole and your prayer of course is always answered <laughs> then peace, joy, you know, if your prayer is for God and nothing but God, you know, then the, the state that you receive is, is a state of, of joy and peace and everything. When you have, it's tainted with desires for other things, you know. Uh, Marianne Williamson, in her book, um, I forget how she put it, do I want peace or do I want him to call? <laughs> yeah, that's what it I want him to call, you know. I mean, there's right. a prayer, you know. Right. That's a good example of, yeah. of a prayer in the sense that I, it's more important that he call me today <laughs> sometime today then, it, then my peace is, you know. And so you can start to get at those levels of desire, how important it is to get in touch with our unconscious beliefs and to really start to see what the ego's beliefs are and what its purpose is and then to say, hey, I don't want, I'm not going to keep plugging this and plying in. I'm not going to keep following this ego because I want peace. I don't want this pain and misery and that happiness. So that kind of addresses that idea of prayer. It, it certainly gets away from... Um, prayer for specifics in the sense that a lot of prayers, even among unity and, and a lot of uh, new age types of thinking, are very much tied into abundance and, and courses on abundance and everything, and, and literally praying, visualizing, using the power of the mind to visualize the kind of house, the kind of life, the kind of whatever you want. Once again, Jesus does not condemn this, but it's, uh, it's more still worth, now in the middle run, that in a sense, you're, the experience, if you visualize something, and you hold that in mind, and you hold that in mind, and it seems to come, that's a powerful experience that, that there's some power to this mind thing, that, that, that my mind is powerful. It's a definitely an experience that, that flies in the face of I'm a weak, little, helpless nobody, and I'm at the whim and, and the victim of everything in the world. But what the Song of Prayer does, and the Course in general, says, okay, now you're starting to learn that your mind has power, and you actually can, can it seem to manifest things, you know, it seems that way. The script is written, it's already happened, you're still just watching the past, but it seems as if, experientially, the things are coming to me that I want and that I, try, I focus on, so my mind's got power. Then Jesus says, okay, now you're starting to see that your mind is powerful. How about peace as your only goal? Peace of mind, enlightenment, salvation. Take that powerful mind that you're starting to realize that you have and, and give it to me or give it to the Holy Spirit and, and Start putting peace as your goal. Peace is abstract. I mean, how, how do you quantify peace? You know, it's this abstract kind of purpose, again, that's hard to get a grasp on. How am I at peace when I'm with my 
my my brother or my sister. Peace and judgment don't go <laughs> go together. Peace and interpretation is it, it definitely gives us a lot of experience. But those are like the higher rungs where instead of praying for specifics, please bring me this, please give me that, please bring an end to world hunger and so on and so forth. Please have it be a sunny day or a hot sunny day, you know, on, when we're having our family picnic or whatever, you know. Instead of praying for specifics, you start to hold this abstract goal of peace in mind and then allowing and accepting you don't have an investment in, in the form as much and, and the peace starts to come because you're not invested in, in the form. And the joy starts to get so intense, you know, as you start to ascend up that ladder that it's not seen as a sacrifice that those things like that seem important, it's praying for certain specifics, you know, seem like a real big deal, the joy starts to be so intense, I mean, the well starts to bubble up inside so much, that it's like, oh, I can't believe <laughs> that I thought that that would have brought me happiness and peace. But at the time, sometimes you can't see that, you know. You need to have that experience of, of praying for something and getting it. So that kind of goes to prayer. And then you mentioned, mentioned will, and I think we touched on that last time, that God's will for his son, for, for us, is perfect happiness. You know, I, I liked it when it was put that way. <laughs> I've heard all these things that I've grown up about. Well, it's God's will that people starve, and it's God's will that this happened and this and that. God's will is for perfect happiness. Now, the Course also goes on to say that, that God's will is not known in this world, that this world was made to cover over and to to make up a will, an alien will, which is the ego, apart from God's will, which is where all pain and grief and misery come in. And that when we talk about free will, free will is when the, the mind is, has accepted the atonement and is healed, then the will is free, because the Father and the Son's will are one, and the Son knows it. <laughs> the Son knows that his will is not apart from his Father. Jesus knew that as a fact. 